Hello, this is Daily Future. The day is the 27th of March, 2020. I'm Mark Pesci with my co-host, futurist designer and exponential thinker, Sally Dominguez. Welcome back, Sally. Mark, I'm so excited right now. Can I tell you my, why? Do I? Do you mind if I tell you why I'm very, Please. very twitchy right now? Please. I've just finished a COVID-19 hackathon with UC Berkeley and the Center for Neglected Diseases. It doesn't feel very neglected, COVID-19 right now, but... Uh, so exciting people from all over the world whooshing up trying to come up on the fly with solutions we were doing a triage system for patients in respiratory distress when mm. there's not enough ventilators you know mm -hmm. so interesting yeah anyway, that's all i'm just i'm a bit buzzy so forgive me if i talk too fast so how i mean if you're doing that how quickly can you deploy something like that because clearly in a place like new york probably in new orleans within a couple of days probably florida not long after that they're right. going to have a need for it so how quickly can you go from something that's being floated in a hackathon to something that people can actually deploy clinically so so my whole point with my team and i was fairly persuasive was to design something that could be immediately implemented and this triage system can be done like immediately but What's interesting and what I think brings it into any discussion on changing mindset is it is so hard to get a medical professional. They're a bit like physicists, right? They're fully about expertise and repeated protocol. Yeah. Try and get anyone to accept a brand new concept on the fly that hasn't been tested. Like you can't even get them to interview with you about it because they don't want to be caught on record giving you any form of advice. Yet that is the thinking we need for a mm -hmm. pandemic. But the first line of the Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm, right? And this is the That's thing right. is they're running into that. And so we do need to now think not just about creating new solutions, but I guess thinking about how, how to be able to do testing at exponential speed, which is something we kind of have never had to do before. And now well, yeah, we're you can being digitally asked to think test, that way. But, but can you digitally test? I mean, because we're writing a protocol here for a scenario where a ventilator designed for one patient is being hurriedly manipulated into serving four, which we're mm. seeing right now in Detroit and no doubt in New York, it's happening on the fly. This triage will help those people in times of stress kind of bingo card the right number of people to the ventilator because now you've got to look at body mass. You've got right. to look at symptoms and group them. You know, all of the thinking is not developed world hospital thinking. This is like reverting back probably to Spanish flu, you know, yeah. but all of these guys are like, well, we need to know it's been done before. And I'm sitting there going, are you kidding? Me? But yeah. it's hard. It's hard. Okay. So I have a feeling that in some sense they will be moved along, unfortunately, by demand, by need. It's and horrible, to come back it's to a that. It's horrible reality, but it's true. Yeah. I, I always read Ars Technica, which is one of the Condé Nast websites, first thing in the morning, and I read it first thing this morning, and it told the story of an Uber driver who had just died of COVID-19 that they do believe he caught from a passenger who was infected. And there's, you know, Uber doesn't offer sick pay. They were kind of using that as a stick to beat Uber and, you know, line me up to beat Uber with a stick. That's not really <laughs> my point here. Something we mentioned the other day, though, is that anyone who's doing frontline work with people, whether that's a delivery person, whether that's a rideshare driver, whether that's a postie, it, all of these people, and I mean, even people who are, you know, running the takeaway at the local cafe. Yeah, the barista people, is also at risk, you know? Yeah. All of these people mm -hmm. who are actually interacting with people by their own choice are a taking a risk and will be taking a risk until they either get through an infection and get to the other side or until we have a vaccine which means and you know everyone's very hopeful that we'll have a vaccine in 12 to 18 months but there's no proof that we'll have a vaccine in 12 to 18 months so i i don't want to sort of deflate people because i know we're hanging on to that but we have to be aware that in fact everyone who's got a front line with people you know, starting with medical professionals who are dropping like flies now. Every one of yeah. these people are now in harm's way. And that allows us to rethink how we actually take a job that was not well paid before and say, actually, there is a danger associated with this. You need to be compensated appropriate to the risk you're taking. Yeah, we value you. In essence, we value you, not because you're a body that's doing what everyone else does. You're a body that's doing what a ton of people are not willing to do. Yeah. Yeah. 
And and so I, I've been talking for a while that I could see us revaluing the human economy, that the things that are difficult to automate, such as delivering something on a bicycle or via a car or any of the other human tasks, being in a call center and answering someone's actually hearing hard question when they're upset, all of these things that are human tasks, these are the ones that are actually truly valuable because these are the ones that we will not be able to easily automate away. And in a way, the pandemic has revealed this, has ripped back the surface and shown us shining through the importance of humanity, that we're doing things and taking risks because we want to do that. And we need to have people paid for that. And that may mean that your Uber ride costs twice as much and maybe it should right now so that that person mm. has a savings fund so that if they get a little bit sick, they can take the time off or they can go see the doctor. Yeah, I, th I think what's really tricky right now is that most people are not using Uber and the people that are yeah. using Uber are the people that are then also doing those jobs. So you're yeah. doubling down on the risk. The Uber guy has numerous people in his car. That person has numerous interactions at their end. You bring these two at-risk service workers together I mean, honestly, they're in a situation that any of us would be actively trying to avoid right now. And right. these guys are in it because that's what they do. All right. So let's let's we got to we got to park that there. We'll clearly come back to that next week when we invite our old buddy Drew Smith onto the show to I talk agree. about what's going on in transport because clearly this is part of that larger story that you and I really want to get to but we'll have Drew on because Drew is our partner in this next week and we'll talk about that now I was on one of these lovely dinner parties I was a birthday party for a friend the other night we were all on zoom in our various windows some folks were in Sydney some were in Adelaide you know we were all over the place having a lovely time and one of my friends in Adelaide says oh yes I've moved my yoga studio onto Skype now and she's really just enjoying it. She's like, it's completely low tech. And I wake up this morning and that's another <laughs> thing on Ars Techna is that yoga has moved suddenly online. We closed all of the yoga studios in Australia about 48 hours ago. You closed them in, a, in California, what, two weeks ago. All of these mm -hmm. things are going on now. Mm -hmm. And so it's lovely because, in fact, there's a lot of ways for people to be able to still maintain their practice Right, Even and you when say isolated. yoga, I say boxing. I'm a super high intensity type of gal, as you know. I and, had uh, noticed. <laughs> hard to imagine. And what's interesting is that every morning at a certain time, my 21 year old put me onto this, Barry's boot camp does a 20 minute live workout. Oh. And it is so low tech. I figured they'd be sending the Barry's dude into the Barry's to have like the surrounding. But what I find intriguing about this Corona 19 rethink of digitization is the realness. We are talking super authentic. This dude is working out with his shabby couch in the background and he's kind of motivating us. His music isn't even pumping. And I'm trying to look, I'm trying to see what he's doing, but his lounge is kind of in the way and his cat's over in the corner, but it's so good. And you get this feeling that like we're all in it together yeah. and we don't need to pretend that this is perfect. We can actually all acknowledge that this is a kind of a shamozzle, but it's a very human shamozzle. And, I, you know, I did watch a little bit of uh, the NBC News last night and the opening statement was everyone's calling this the great adjustment. And with that thought, <laughs> Sal, it has been great to talk to you again on The Daily Future. Always great to adjust with you, Mark. Stay safe, mate. Stay safe, Sal.